you you have now um, pointed out many of the challenges yeah. uh, that our community faces. Um, looking at individual leadership, looking at organizational leadership, looking at leadership on the part of governments, uh, how can we take that step forward um, to address uh, the issues where we see the potential for climate change that uh, I think many are saying could result in uh, perhaps hundreds of millions of internally displaced uh, due to, to, to environmental hazards. Uh, one only needs to take a look at the situation in Darfur uh, to see that humanitarian space and uh, lack of respect for humanitarian principles. Um, all that is to say that uh, things are not necessarily getting better. Um, so what do we need to do, what can we do to achieve some measurable results uh, short of uh, uh, additional funding that goes into this field? Um, for me, the, the fundamental issue here is politics, actually. Um, at, the, at, the, you know, at, the, at the level of public service, at the level of academia, and so on, there's, there's a lot that we need to do to get right. We need to have good tools, we need to have sufficient funding, we need evidence bases, we need, to, you know, we need to underpin our work. But the fundamental challenge for me is politics. Uh, it's, and, and politics not in a big P capital sense of just uh, heads of state or, or ministers, but actually uh, building a, a, a political commonality between how people like myself and, and you and you know, people who are working in government actually approach international problems. How do we define these problems? How do we understand these problems? How do we believe? What is the basis of, of, of our response? And that's, uh, and that's about building coalitions and commonality of view that stretches not just between the traditional partners, those who can afford to have taken an interest, uh, the West, Europe, the North America, international agencies. It's about stretching that out across the globe. When I see colleagues from Egypt, or Indonesia, or Brazil, or Mexico, or China, or Malaysia, or any number of countries, India. Um, in our interconnected world, they are increasingly as aware as somebody living in, you know, in, in, in London today of what is going on around their world. And their impetus, their, their impulse to, to respond and to react is no different to ours. But the history of, of, of uh, the development business, the humanitarian business, is a history that's uh, very firmly located in the West. It's located very much in, in a European tradition, uh, in, in, in a North American tradition. Uh, but that needs to change. We need to build, we need to translate uh, our humanitarianism into, into a language that's understood around the globe. And I think it's beginning to happen. So, you know, you've only to look at, for example, how the Chinese authorities dealt with the earthquake last year, uh, or indeed the Indonesians, or the Mozambicans, or the Pakistanis have dealt with their recent disasters, and what you see is increasingly that they're looking to respond to their own emergencies. There's an impulse, there's an understanding that if disaster strikes, they need to respond to their people. But with that, increasingly also comes a sense of, well, if we can help our own people, can we help our neighbours? The ASEAN played a very, very interesting and creative role uh, at the time of the Burma cyclone last year. Their motivations were, were, were driven by humanitarianism. And inevitably in these environments, there is a political dimension to this. So for me, the big, the big challenge here is how do we broaden the understanding of, of, of international problems and how do we build a common impulse? Uh, and and that, that means us being ready to concede mm -hmm. ground and to understand other people's perspectives. But it's, it's that which will win us the political space in which the problems of Darfur or Sri Lanka or in Afghanistan can be addressed by the international community.